The 22nd Psalm is called the Psalm of the Cross because it's the Bible's best description of Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. The Psalm is an inspired prophecy of David, describing in detail the sufferings of our Lord Jesus as he paid the price on the cross for your sins and mine. When we think of David in the Bible, we may think of the shepherd boy who became king of Israel, or we may think of him as the warrior who was not permitted to build the temple, or we often think of him as the talented songwriter who wrote many of the Psalms. But David was also a prophet, as spoken of by the Apostle Peter, whose words were recorded by Luke, the Gospel writer. The book of Acts describes David as therefore being a prophet. So let's take a look at the prophetic Psalm of the Cross written by David as he was inspired by God. Here are the words spoken by Jesus on the cross, the words of the 22nd Psalm, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These words of Jesus were recorded by Matthew and Mark. The psalm writer records even more words that Jesus never spoke out loud, words of anguish, why are you so far from helping me, and from the words of my roaring. The word roaring here means my groaning in utter suffering. Both outwardly and inwardly, Jesus is suffering horrible pain. He is feeling forsaken by his beloved Heavenly Father. It was sinners like you and me that deserved to be forsaken by God, but Jesus was the forsaken one so that you and I would never be forsaken. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you hear not, and in the night season, and am not silent. Jesus had cried out to the Father in the night in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he still cries out now from the cross, Why have you forsaken me, my Father? He prays without ceasing, but it is as if the Father is deaf to his cry. If the Father will not answer, it is as though the Father cannot hear. But of course we know that our God hears every cry, yet God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But you are holy, O you that inhabit the praises of Israel. In his great pain and anguish, the sinless Son of God still has absolute confidence in the Father. Though the Father may seem deaf and distant, Jesus knows in whom he trusts, his holy Abba Father, and the Father does not change like the shifting shadows. Thy will be done, Father, not my will. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you did deliver them. God is the same yesterday and today and forever. He answers the prayers of those who trust in Him. He delivers us out of all our troubles. The God that answered prayers yesterday is the same God who is trusted in today by His beloved Son. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not confounded. The prophet Jeremiah had told of a time when the fathers in Israel had not trusted in God in the 14th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. And so the Lord God had sent a drought upon the land, and the fathers sent their little ones, their children, to go out and fetch water from the springs and pools of water. But the children had returned to the fathers with empty vessels because the waters were dried up. And the prophet says that the Israelites were ashamed and confounded. But when the fathers in Israel returned to the Lord with their whole hearts, they were delivered. When they trusted in the God of Israel, they were not confounded. 
but I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. As our Lord suffers on the cross, he feels that he is accounted as a worm and not a man. He feels the pain of being ignored by his Father in heaven and despised by the people, unheard by God and cast off by men, counted so unworthy, so insignificant, that he has not shown any mercy from heaven or from earth. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head. The people who have rejected him, despised him, and condemned him, now they stare at him, at his dying body, and they mock him. They deride him. They scorn him with words like daggers that shoot out from their lips shaking their heads with utter contempt. Saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. These words of the 22nd Psalm are the words spoken by those who mocked Jesus as he hung on the cross. In fulfillment of this prophecy, the Gospel writer Matthew records these words spoken by Jesus' tormentors. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Matthew 27, 43. The irony here is that the fulfillment of this messianic prophecy was one more sign telling them that Jesus is the Messiah, and the mockers were fulfilling the prophecy themselves even as they were rejecting their Messiah, all at the same time. But you are he that took me out of the womb. You did make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. As Jesus hangs dying on the cross, he feels the sharp contrast with his infancy when he was in the safety and security of God's tender mercies, surrounded with loving care. I was cast upon you from the womb. You are my God from my mother's belly. People who live through near-death experiences often say their whole life flashed before their eyes. Our Lord Jesus looks back on his life on earth. He recalls infancy with his parents, their poverty, their many stories to him of his miraculous birth, of his lying in a manger, of the shepherds and wise men and prophecies, the persecution from King Herod, their flight into Egypt, the return to Nazareth, that poor despised town of Galilee. He has trusted in his heavenly Father since birth, trusted in his God through all his life. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help, no one to give him any aid or comfort. Those who were willing to help him could not, and those who could help him would not. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Those who surround Jesus as he suffers on the cross, he calls them strong bulls, like the strong bulls of Bashan. The land of Bashan was the land east of the Jordan River and east of the Sea of Galilee that had been given to the half-tribe of Manasseh in days gone by. It was a very rich land, very fertile, with very good soil, thick with grass, the very best pasture land, which produced well-fed, large, healthy cattle with strong bulls known as the strongest throughout Israel. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. 
the thoughts of Jesus as he suffers on the cross. The word ravening here means voraciously devouring. Jesus sees those who despise him to be like a greedy lion that tears away at its prey, fiercely tearing it to pieces in its haste to devour it. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. The Son of God, the Alpha and Omega, the Word of God who made all things, the giver of life and light of the world, he was now rendered powerless. All his strength was dissolved as he poured out his holy life to make atonement for the sins of all who would trust in him. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you have brought me into the dust of death. A potsherd is a broken piece of clay pottery, dry and weak and easy to crumble into dust. The tongue of our Lord literally adheres to his mouth as he is now dying of thirst. Jesus is just ready to die and is now approaching the grave, the place where lies the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. The scripture here paints a picture of the enemies of Jesus who surround him. They are like a hungry pack of dogs who are on the hunt for prey, snarling, fierce, ferocious. They surround the Savior and they enclose him as in the garden of Gethsemane where they took him and arrested him, closing in on him. And they also surrounded him as he stood trial before Pilate and Herod. And now they stand all around him as his blood drips from his dying body. His hands and feet are torn by the cruel Roman nails that pierce his flesh. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. Our Lord Jesus is observing as he hangs on the cross that all his bones are visible, protruding from his suffering body. They are so prominent as his body is so stressed and emaciated. Those who surround him stare at his distorted frame. Isaiah prophesied of the Savior, many were astonished at you, for his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. They part my garments among them, and cast lots upon my vesture. As we've already said, this prophecy was fulfilled by the Roman soldiers. The sense here is that the only thing of value that can be found in this dying man is his clothing. As Jesus hangs on the cross, dying for the sins of the whole world, those who crucified him place no value on the man himself. He is a worthless criminal, and in their eyes his clothing is worth much more than he is. Like so many today who claim to look toward God, but they only see value in what valuables may be obtained from God. But be not far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste you to help me. Do not leave me, Father, but rather sustain me and deliver me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. The word soul literally means my life. The life of a man is his living soul. The sword that threatens our Lord now is the intense suffering of his soul. 
the word darling is used only twice in the entire Bible, here and in Psalm 35. It literally means my soul, my one and only life, my darling, my soul, my only one. Jesus agonizes in silent prayer to the Father. Again, as in verse 16, our Lord identifies those who surround him as being like hungry dogs, with each dog in the pack reaching out to tear him and devour him. Save me from the lion's mouth, for you have heard me from the horns of the unicorns. The Bible says our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. In verse 21, our Lord uses the lion instead of the dog to characterize those who surround him. Jesus silently prays for deliverance from the roaring lion. Save me, for you hear me. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the unicorns. For years, many interpreters have translated the Hebrew word used here as wild oxen or wild bulls. Even Strong's Concordance translates this Hebrew word as bulls. That was because for centuries, people believed the mention of unicorns in ancient literature was a fabrication. They thought that unicorns were a myth. But unicorn fossils have now been discovered in northern Scotland, in Kazakhstan, and Siberia. These very powerful animals were huge, standing tall like modern-day Clydesdales and Shires and Percherons or Belgian horses. They had a single horn growing from their skull, hence their name, unicorns. They are mentioned in the Bible nine times and also appear in ancient Greek and Indian literature. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise you. The Son of God trusts the Father to save him. He knows that in his death on the cross, death is forever defeated. I will, Jesus declares, I will rise up to make God known, to make God's salvation known. Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. And in the midst of his disciples, in the midst of his newborn church, Jesus will yet praise the Father. You that fear the Lord, praise him. All you, the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All you, the seed of Israel. The thoughts of our Lord upon the cross. It's as if he is already risen from the dead and in the midst of the congregation of his disciples. Praise the Lord, all you who reverence the Lord and worship his name. All you seed of Jacob, all you children of Abraham, the father of all who have faith in God, the Bible says. The children of Abraham are all the true worshipers of God. The Israel of God, it says in the New Testament, these are all true born-again Christians. This is the church, the Israel of God, the true children of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither has he hid his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. Again, our Lord reaffirms his absolute trust in the Father. Though for a time the afflicted experiences affliction, it is only for a time. Mark records in his gospel that Jesus was crucified at the third hour, that is the third hour after sunrise or about 9 a.m. by our time. Mark records that Jesus died at about the ninth hour or about 3 p.m. by our time. The horrible time of our Lord's suffering on the cross was six agonizing hours. His prayer was heard. The Father heard his desperate cry. The work of the Son of God on the cross was accomplished, and Jesus would arise triumphant 
from the dead. My praise shall be of you in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. Jesus paid his vows to the Father in the sight of all those who trust in God. For our Lord had vowed in the garden, not my will, but thy will be done, Father. And our Lord had also vowed, of all the Father has given me, I will not lose even one. Jesus paid his vows when he paid our debt on the cross. He suffered and died for all our sins to make us clean in the eyes of God, saved for all eternity. This is to the praise of the Father in the midst of the great congregation, God's church. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Because Jesus died on the cross, the bread of life is given to a hungry world. Those who eat of this bread will never hunger and will never die. They will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For they have found God. They have found the narrow way. They have sought after eternal life, and it has been given to them. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before you. Jesus had said to his disciples, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say to you, except a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. As our Lord suffers on the cross, he looks ahead toward the great harvest that is coming. His death on the cross brings forth much fruit from among every tribe and language and nation. Yes, to the very ends of the earth. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. Above his head, as he hangs on the cross, Pilate had posted the notice that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Jesus had stood trial before Pilate, the Roman governor, and Herod the king of Judea. But as Jesus looks ahead, he knows all the governments of this world are not long for this world. For Jesus is king of kings, lord of lords, the righteous and rightful governor of all nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. The fat upon the earth are the prosperous and proud who will be humbled before God. As he hangs on the cross, our Lord can see the day afar off when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. For all people go down to the dust, and no one can save his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. The children of God will serve the Lord. Jesus had told his disciples that the gospel of the kingdom would be proclaimed in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end would come. In the midst of his suffering on the cross, our Lord can see the days ahead when his people will glorify their Savior and spread the word of life to all who will believe in him. The final verse of Psalm 22, they shall come and shall declare his righteousness to a people that shall be born, that he has done this. Jesus had told his disciples to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send workers into the harvest fields. 
With confidence, our Lord looks ahead to the faithful Christians, Christ's ones, who for centuries to come would keep the gospel message alive, preserving the word of God and proclaiming its truth to a people yet to be born. The gospel message to all the world that God has done this. God has provided one way of salvation through Jesus Christ. Psalm 22 began with the words of Jesus on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The psalm now ends with the words, He has done this. The last words of Jesus on the cross, It is finished.